Welcome everybody. This is Two Ed Tech Guys. Take questions and share cool stuff. And we are very happy that you are joining us today. Uh, normally this fall, uh, these, uh, these episodes are going to be recorded on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Today is not such a day, but uh, no worries. We hope that you will join us regularly for these. And by the way, I just noticed that one of our, our attendees in, in our group is Kachar from the Bahamas. That, that sounds like a pretty good place to ride out the pandemic. Um, I, that just, that's my first thought. Okay, good. So let's jump into this stuff. I will now turn on the captions. How did I remember to do it? Not too big a mystery that, that really right there, but uh, we'll, we'll toss this in and see how well it does. Okay. We want to toss out some thank yous because thank yous are a good thing to do in life. If you haven't been thanking people recently, I, I suggest that you meditate a little bit on that. Um, first, uh, to the, the Krauss Center for Innovation at Foothill College in uh, Los Altos Hills, California. The, all of the participants from the Merit Program who might catch this uh, in, in recording as well. Love you guys. Great having you as a part of what we do. Uh, if you're curious about that program, stay in touch with me. Amazing professional development uh, in and around technology and philosophy and professionalism and collegiality and coolness. That's what that is. Uh, and then also we want to toss out a big thank you to Free Technology for Teachers and love the, love the new slide on this one. So uh, now if, if somebody's like, wait, wait, what is Free Tech for Teachers? Richard, I'll bet you've got an answer for that question. I've got an answer for that. My answer is it's a little project that I started 13 years ago to try to keep track of things I was trying and doing in my classroom. And 15,000 blog posts later, it keeps going. And I cover all kinds of ed tech related things uh, from open source software, which reminds me I have a prop for today that I forgot to grab from the side of the room to Google stuff and everything in between Microsoft stuff. I've, I've, I've got it all somewhere in there. Excellent. Now, my little, my little professional shindig is a, is, is a website and a nonprofit that I started in 2005 called Next Vista for Learning. What's that? That is a library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content. My own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. All right, so I hope that that is something that you will take a look at because we got all kinds of good stuff there for teachers and students. And if you look at it and you're like, hey, I want to talk to you about some of that stuff, by all means, stay in touch. You will get contact info as a part of this. We've got more than one person from the Bahamas. How cool is that? All right, uh, the library has videos about uh, academic stuff and communities around the world and service to others and English language and careers and advice for teens and the list kind of goes on and on. Stay in touch with me on that. Uh, yesterday, Susan Stewart and I did, a, did an activities across grade levels webinar on fake news. And you're like, wow, fake news. Yes, fake news. We had one of the authors of uh, Fact Versus Fiction, right? And that author, Darren Hudgens, he and Jennifer Lagarde wrote the book, Fact Versus Fiction. They're working on a, on a second, uh, second edition, not a, not a second edition, a second book with a lot of more material in it. A lot of more material, thank you very much. Uh, and, and that will be something that I am excited to see for sure. That recording is now on our webinars section of our site. We got lots of good stuff there. All of the episodes Richard and I have done are there. Just so much good stuff, so little time. All right, so how's this gonna work today? What we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna work with a question or two, then we're gonna share a cool thing, do that again, share a cool thing, do a few more questions, and then we'll stop the recording. But if you stick around, we might just talk to you a little bit further as we do every time when we're not time crunched on something else. So with that, Richard, why don't you, why don't you get us going? P pull a question out of the hat. We had quite a few on that doc. Just let us know what you're seeing. All right, let's start with, uh, let's start with this one. Hey, Richard, Richard, Richard I just combined <laughs> our names. Hi, Richard and Rustin. Uh, this is Brian. Uh, so uh, I am thinking that we need a way, preferably online, where students can submit usernames and passwords where I can see all students' info and where students can retrieve this info if they forget the username or password. I've thought about a Google spreadsheet and forms, but I'm wondering if there's a more clever way to do this with an online site. Parents and students complain that we take students that we take students to too many sites, they forget their login info. So that's my clever way to make all this happen easily. Brian, so let me, 
start with this. Don't. Right, right, <laughs> uh, right. Uh, that is a legal minefield that I do not want to go down. Uh, of trying to keep track of students' usernames and passwords, um, you know, particularly for our kids who are over the age of 13, we're getting into a whole legal minefield that I, I do not want to tackle. But all hope is not lost, Brian. Uh, you could or I, I, actually just encourage your students whenever possible to use, if you're a G Suite for Education school, use your G Suite for Education you know, login if that's, a, if that's a, an opportunity on that third party service, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, I think of Edpuzzle, for example, as a popular service, right? You can sign into that using your Google, Google credentials. Or if you're a Microsoft school, a lot of third party sites have a Microsoft credential login option. Use that or Clever. Use one of those whenever possible. I would encourage that. But I would not encourage writing down student usernames and passwords. And I definitely want to do it in a Google spreadsheet because Google Forms Terms of Service actually says explicitly not to do that. Definitely, definitely a lot to be careful about with that. I, I would echo all of the same thoughts. You might spend a little time on the front end of the semester uh, you know, if, if you aren't kind of going the easier route of making sure that you are using sites that, uh, that you're going to combine with the, with the Google um, login, things like that, to, to, do, to do a lesson on, okay, how, how, do you, how do you create passwords, right? How do you create a password that you will remember and that is also secure? So, you know, if your pet's name is Spot and, and your, your passwords are like Spot exclamation point, easy to figure out. But uh, on the other hand, if you've got kind of a standard, a standard set of uh, things that you put on the front end, it could be like, uh, you know, you always start with something like uh, the at sign and the, you know, a capital Q and, and a dash, right? Or, or whatever, whatever it might be. If you always start with something like that, recognizing that dashes may or may not be usable in a, in a password, uh, then you, you might end up with something that, uh, that where, where the students have much better sense of, of how to build their own passwords. So maybe it's, it's at sign, uh, capital Q, and then uh, you know, you've got some word, th then you've got like spot, and, and then you've got something that, that references the company that it is in some fashion. If you, if you come up with a pattern, that might be good. Uh, so you know, es essentially, the, the student only needs to remember two or three characters on the front end, perhaps, um, and then a particular word that they always use, good. And then, you know, something that, you know, is kind of an obvious guess based on the site. Now, that, that's, that, that may be a lot, a lot more work than you want, but it is something worth knowing. It's, awfully, it's an awfully good uh, life skill. Cool. Want to do another question? Yeah, let's do another question. And by the way, I put in the chat some, a couple of great videos from Common Craft. Mm. Uh, shout out to Lee and Sashi about creating strong passwords and account security in general that are worth sharing with your kids. Uh, so let's do another question though. Uh, which is better to use to build a website? Google Sites, Weebly, or any other suggestions? Mary. So uh, kind of, I've got a lot of experience in this. Now, my websites are not pretty usually, but they're very functional. Uh, so I got a lot of experience in this regard. I will say, depends on what your purpose is. If you are making a website just for your, for your school, right? if you're a G Suite for Education school, and you're making a website for your class or for your, for your school, use Google Sites. You know, use Google Sites because you're already in there, you already have, you're, already, you know, you're already in there. Uh, if you're gonna have kids, do, and likewise, if you're gonna have kids make the sites and you're already in Google Sites, or they're already in G Suite, use Google Sites. But if you're trying to teach things like web design or you know, back end type of things, then you might want to start looking at something that's not uh, what you see is what you get editor. Maybe you want to do something like you know, a custom install of WordPress where you're, you're doing the hosting and kids will, and you can have complete control over it and complete, 
you know, complete flexibility from A to Z in it. So that, that's, that's where I've started to think about what is your purpose of, of building a site? You know, uh, so it's hard to recommend just one flat out uh, option. But I'd, then, I'd piggyback on that by saying- ones like that, Weebly and, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, I'm gonna, I'll piggyback on that by saying that, that the, the key thing is that start simply, right? Wh whatever it is you need to do, start simply. And so like Google Sites is a pretty simple option. However, why do you want to create the site? So th this is kind of in the space of, of Richard's comments about purpose, but, but let me take it a step further. What if, for example, you, you want sites because it's a portfolio of student work? Would Google Slides be better for that? And, and that might be the case. Depending on what the students put together, you might want to say what you need is to be able to, to get this to your audience. So, so you might want to use a site. You might want to use a Google Doc or a Google Slide that you, that you publish. There are, of course, equivalents in the Microsoft world and in the Apple world on this as well. But uh, you know, if, if what they're doing is their job is to pick any given tool to be able to do what you ask them to do, there, there is kind of a nice uh, passing of, of, flect, of, of empowerment really on how they approach their learning if you do that. Uh, and so I would, I would encourage you to essentially just say, here's what you need to do. This is your kind of audience. Uh, the default is to create a website and do this, but you may do it another way if you like. I just need to approve it by such and such time. So you know you're getting them started on this stuff. I would say, Richard, that it's about time for a cool thing. I, I would say it is definitely time for a cool thing. Bring it. I've got a cool thing. Fidgets. Fidgets. So what are fidgets, you might ask? Well, fidgets is this box I have here with little buttons. Actually, those aren't buttons. No, sorry, those are buttons. Those are the lights down there. And inside is the guts of it all. It's a little microcontroller. Plugs in, oh, this is, uh, right now I have my humidity sensor hooked up to it. When the humidity changes, the lighting will change. Very cool. Plugs into my USB cable on my computer. But I bring this up because fidgets is a, 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 a set of little gadgets that you can get. You can get them for free, actually. First of all, full disclosure, Fidgets advertised on my blog earlier this month, um, but this whole set is free. Just go to, their, go to the link that I have in the slides. You get this whole set for free. Uh, normally it would cost like 30 bucks. It gives you all the gadgets you need and kids can program all kinds of really cool things with them. Like, like for, for example, I have the humidity sensor hooked up to mine right now. And when the humidity changes, my lighting will change. There's also a motion sensor. Um, and kids can program it in a variety of languages. So they can use Python, they can use Java, uh, they can use C Sharp if they want to. So, but I would do, I would start with Python uh, if it was me. And best part, if you have never coded a thing in your life, don't panic because they walk you through how to do it from start to finish to set up your first one. And once you've set one up, it's really easy to modify it. Once you've gone through the first tutorial, you're like, oh, I got this. And you can modify it to your heart's content. Uh, so they're, they're called fidgets, uh, completely free, gives you all these little things that you see on the bottom there. Uh, yeah, they're really cool. Uh, so they, they probably tricked me a little bit because like I said, they advertised on my blog and they sent me this set and they're sending out sets to people everywhere. Uh, like anyone, like you don't have to be a blogger, just like go to their website, say I'm a teacher, they've got a whole page for it, they'll send you a set. I like it so much, I then ordered 30 of them for my classroom. So that, that's why they send them out, by the way. That's why I send them out, yeah. yeah. Right, right. But, it's, and, uh, but it's really cool. I was going to say, I noticed that in, in the participants area, Sheila raised a hand that might have just been to say, preach on, that's a wonderful thing, or it might be a question. And if it's a question, just toss it into the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly answer it. If you're like, no, I didn't mean to do that at all. You are not a bad person. No worries. 
So let's head to more questions. Richard, pull another question off of uh, off the list from the week, and let's see what we can do with it. All right. Uh, let's see. What is, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine two questions, uh, one that came from Mary and one that came from Bruce. Uh, what is the best way to organize assignments in Google Drive, piggybacking on uh, the question about Google Classroom setup? Do you have a recommended ideal Google Classroom setup that works well in our school? The consistency, inconsistency of setup makes it confusing for families who have students in more than one grade level. Some organized by topics, some organized by subjects, some organized by day, etc. So, I'll start with the Google Drive question. Of how do you organize Google Drive? Organize assignments in Google Drive? For me, I like Google Classroom do it now. Uh, whenever I make a new assignment, new folders created in Google Drive, and it is what it is. That's kind of how I do it. That's kind of been my attitude about Google Drive since the dawn of time or the dawn of Azure. Google Docs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just let Google Drive do it. And I will go and search for it. I'll use the search function in Google Drive if I'm having trouble looking for it. So that's what I do with Google Drive. I like Google, Google Classroom will organize it for you. Uh, that's probably not- I, I, will, I will second that. I use. Right. So, so Google Classroom, actually the reason they created, effectively the reason they created Google Classroom was to allow the organization of Google Drive stuff with large groups, i.e. students, uh, so that you're not trying to figure out what goes where, the, the naming conventions of the files are, you know, are, are a wonderful piece of how that works. And you can, in Classroom, you can go and see their work without having to go in and open up different files. I mean, it's just, it, Classroom is designed to do that thing of organizing stuff and drive related to work that students do. Now, how to organize it? This, the school that, uh, the number one client really of mine, the school that I work with the most, uh, says, okay, uh, we, they dictate this. You must have a, a resources topic. You must have a class information topic. So like a syllabus would go here, the, uh, uh, you know, the Zoom link to the class would go there. Uh, resources are going to be stuff that are subject specific in some way that you'll 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 use over the course of the semester or year, and then they say organize things from there. Have topics not by the kind of assignment they are, but by the unit. Now, is that the best way to do it? I I don't know, um, but but they tell the teachers to do this consistently, and that uh, that seems to be a, a good good approach for them. Uh, I, I will add that that for a lot of people, the idea of having to create multiple classes because say half the kids are at home and half the kids are, are in school because of hybrid, you know, in this kind of arrangement, uh, has, has brought to the fore uh, an issue that is when, when, you, when you post an assignment in classroom, you can post it to every class you want. When you are scheduling an assignment in classroom, then you, you can only schedule it to the one class. Well, there is a thing called, uh, I think it's called classroom or multi-classroom scheduler. Uh, and I'll, I'll get the link of that into the links page for sure. It's gonna take me some digging to, to pull that out. However, um, it is a, it's an add-on to classroom that was created by a guy in the UK with, with a great accent. Um, and he, uh, he, he has this, this YouTube video about it and, and it points it, it you know, points you to like okay your your apps management person has to add these scripts in so that's a job for your your management person once they're added in you can schedule for multiple classrooms you essentially schedule it for one classroom go into the script thing say this assignment for these classes and and you're scheduled across now understand that if uh, that if Google changes kind of back end things related to the classroom, that the, the ability to make that work may go away. It's also specific to assignments and not say materials and things like that. But I'll, I'll get all that. I'll get all that in the uh, uh, the, the links page for sure. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to find that uh, that that add on, but I I got I'm it. I got it for out. Sure. Yeah. And so actually, let's see, uh, does, that leads into another, another question that I think, uh, I, I think it's actually similar to another question you tossed in about students being at home and students uh, being uh, in, in the classroom, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is, this one is self-serving. Uh, I will say that one. <laughs> this just happened last night. Uh, so this is me, my, my, my real life, as in like not my online life, but my real like teaching my own students life. Uh, so here it is. Uh, my school has introduced a new schedule for the year. Here's how it's going to work. Basically, kids whose last names are A through L will come to school Monday and Tuesday. And kids whose last names are M through Z will come, will be watching at home via Google Meet. Right? Then they'll switch for the second half of the week and alternate on Fridays. Right? So you get the idea of half the class is in the classroom. Half the class is at home, and they switch for the second half of the week, except for Fridays, which are going to alternate, depending on the conditions of the parametric pressure, I think. Not really sure how that's going to be calculated. but <laughs> So here's the dilemma that I now face is most of my class is hands-on. It's PC repair, networking, and programming. So what do you do with the kids? Like, There's already been some discussion among, amongst colleagues at my school of, well, some kids are some kids just going to sit at home and watch while their classmates are doing stuff in class. Like, you know, my, my colleague who teaches auto repair, uh, what are the kids at home going to do? They're just going to sit and watch while everyone else does breaks on the car. And then they come in and do breaks on the car later in the week while everyone else are, you know, so, what, you know, how is that going to, to play out? So, uh, so Richard, I have, I have an answer for you. Is it perfect? Yeah. No, but hopefully it is, it is a useful one. So as we think about highly hands-on classes, you know, th this particular arrangement is, is clearly problematic. Now, even with kind of core subject classes, you're, you're facing some major challenges when the idea is, no, 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 you're teaching everybody, just half of them are in the room and half of them are not. Well, uh, I would certainly steer clear of have the group that's at home watch that may be easier, but you're gonna lose those students in no time, right? Like no time. So, so what do you do with the group at home? I would contend that, that one, of the, one of the issues that we have with a lot of our classes is that we don't, we don't do review effectively such that stuff sticks, so that, such that, stuff, that kids can build off of the things we teach. And, and so one of the ways to address that issue in this environment is to say, I'm gonna come up with a set of protocols is harken back to like, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know the, the edgy protocols folks, but protocols that essentially say things like, okay, when I have the kids Monday, Tuesday, the kids in class are going to be doing this hands-on thing. The kids at home are going to be looking at a particular topic of, of some vintage, right? And their job is to, for example, in a video protocol, what do they do? They, in teams, they have to collaboratively create a script. They talk through that script. They get feedback on the script. They notate this, you know, like that with the feedback they're getting. They have to talk about those things. Um, they, they then create a draft video tutorial about that particular topic that they've done before. They get feedback on that topic. Depending on how long you've got these kids, you, this could stretch out over several hours. And Richard, I know you've got one of these groups for like three hours a day or something, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so, so having, having something like that that builds, um, it builds content and discussion about the kinds of things that people encounter uh, could, be, could be very useful in that. Just, have, just try to have several. So if, if you can have, say, three or four like that, that, that spreads across you know, you know, several weeks. And it means that you're able to use the hands-on portion. Instead of trying to recreate it, you're able to use that for both Monday, Tuesday, and for Wednesday, Thursday, which, which might be helpful to you. It's going to be interesting. So stay tuned. Stay, stay tuned to see how it plays out this semester. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see. And, uh, and, I think, and I think that as we talk about exactly that kind of thing, it gets us into the space of how do you deal with teams online? All right. So my, I've, I've got like this, I got this share. I got, I got this multi-level share that I'm quite proud of. Everybody get yourself ready. All right. So the first thing is that last Friday, uh, I did a I did a quick webinar on specifically on Zoom's breakout rooms, right? And that recording is on our site. If you've been like, oh my God, I, I need to learn that, go to the site. I share that, share it with others, talk about it with each other. That's that's the kind of thing. But but bonus tip. Oh my God. All right, get ready for this. This is, this is huge fun. When we, when we talk about the idea of creating uh, breakout rooms manually, we run into an issue. Zoom's Zoom's pre-assigned breakout rooms, ah, it, 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 
it seems like you need a degree to be able to kind of handle that effectively. And, and there's some stuff related to how things happen within the domain. You can't just, can't just say, you can't just say these addresses from wherever this Gmail, this Yahoo, whatever, right, will, will automatically populate a breakout room. It, it doesn't really work that way. And consequently, even if you see a group repeatedly, you, you're going to have to keep recreating these rooms. Now, that's added complication if you, for example, have kids who are, are they have a bad connection and so they're, they're falling out and coming back in and you have to reassign them. It's work. However, just this morning, Cass Pereira, all right, the, the maker in residence uh, or the teacher in residence, she, she's the, the way cool person in residence at the Krause Center and I were talking about some things and she talked about this. Get ready. Start class. You've got the, you've got the kids' names over here on the, let me get this. You get the kids' names over here on the left, and their job is to rename themselves. You have to let them rename themselves, which is the default, but you can turn that off in the web settings. But they have to be able to do it. To rename themselves team name, in this case, cities, right? So you got Paris, Paris, Tokyo, Tokyo, Paris, Tokyo, San Francisco, all right? And, and so they rename themselves so that their team name comes first and then their name. Why is this useful? For a couple of reasons. First of all, in the participants list, on, uh, on Zoom, you can tell who's done what so that they've done it right. You can be like, hey, Richard, you, you didn't add your team name. Oh, sorry, Mr. Hurley. And then, and then that gets changed. But even better, when it comes time to assign the rooms, 15 seconds. You just click on, on the room bit and then you, you see, because it's alphabetical, you see them by the team names. So you're just like, click, 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 click. Go to the next one, boom, click, 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 boom, click, 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 click. You've got your teams. And I think that is crazy brilliant. And, and I forget the person who, who was explaining that to Cass, uh, somebody on, on, uh, on some webinar yesterday, but whoever that person is, you're a deity. Great, great idea. Boom. All right, Richard, next question. All right, uh, actually, probably have... last question as well. Probably the last question. So let's make it a good one. Mm. Uh, Sandy asked, any ideas on how to, since you talked about breakout rooms, any ideas on how to use breakout rooms with Chromebooks? We're distributing Chromebooks to all of our students, but can't use breakout rooms with Zoom. Don't know if there's a way with Google Meet. There is. For now, there is a Google Chrome extension that you can use in Google Meet to create breakout rooms. Now, there's a couple of caveats to that. Uh, number one, Google has promised slash threatened to introduce that feature for uh, G Suite for Education Enterprise users later this fall, which means it's, it'll be a paid version. And as Rushton mentioned earlier, if Google changes something with their APIs or changes something on their back end, that extension could stop working at any time. But for now, there is a Google Chrome extension that will do a breakout room function in Google Meet. Yeah, I, I actually am I'm a little curious about the premise of the question. Um, is, Richard, is it your experience that somebody working on a Chromebook cannot get to breakout rooms? That, that's not been my experience. Depends on the Chromebook. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's, that's actually a really good thing to know, right? Um, and and test it out early, early, early in the semester so that you know who might be having that issue. If it's just one kid and the kid has another device available, you might not need to go to the trouble of everything else. Yeah. Uh, some Chromebooks, some of the lower, I'll just say lower end Chromebooks don't have the, let's say the horsepower, if you will, mm. to support all the functions that Zoom actually offers. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen breakouts room, breakout rooms work on, on some fairly old Chromebooks. So, so uh, you know, check and see. It, it may be less of a problem for you than you think. Right. So thank you for being part of what we have been doing today. Stick around. We'll, we'll talk to you a little bit more uh, right afterwards. Uh, the whole thing about what we're doing as we look at this fall is to try to figure out how to, how to work with online teaching and just good teaching practice generally as effectively as we can. And to do that right, we have to care for ourselves. 
Remember that. If you haven't kind of stopped and said, you know, there's a lot of good I do in my life and, you know, I, I can eat right and I, I should take a walk from time to time and get away from the screen. Yes, all of that is true because that allows you to be the kind of teacher a kid may need you to be at any given moment. Now, I hope you will take a look at the, uh, at the newsletter that, that my little nonprofit puts out. Uh, this, is, this is one of those things where uh, there's, there's so much good stuff out there, right? Uh, and you know, arguably the best at getting all that stuff out in front is, is the guy who's working with me today, right? But you should also know that there are, are other newsletters out there. One is mine. So I hope I'm going to stick this here. Boom. All right. So it's in the chat right now. We'll of course get that in the links page that you'll get an email about if you registered for this, right? And, uh, and we'll send that to you as well. It's on, it's a linked on our webinars page as well. We're so helpful. It's like just who we are. All right. And so, so feel free to give that a look. Take a look at my blog. If you're, if you're looking for thoughts about education, rushtonh.com, R-U-S-H-T-O-N-H.com. I would love to get your thoughts on the stuff I do. Uh, including the, the books I've written. Uh, so feel free to give this a look if you have questions about this or if you want to, to do a little book study with your colleagues, uh, I will be happy to, to do a little, a little uh, Zoom or Google Meet situation with you guys just to encourage you. So happy to do it for free. I mean, you bought some books, all good. What is this we're looking at right here, Richard? What you are looking at right there is the cover of the 2019-20 Practical EdTech Handbook which is almost done being updated for the 2021 school year. If you subscribe to my newsletter, practicaledtech.com slash weekly newsletter, you'll get a copy of it emailed to you as soon as it's ready, which is probably going to be Sunday. 56 to 60 pages of all my favorite things, tips, tools, and all kinds of cool stuff. Well, as, as, you, as you put those last pieces in there, you know, make, make sure you're thinking about good little nonprofit video sites. That's got to be in there somewhere. I'm it's hoping. already in there. Good man. Good man. Good man. Been there for years. This is stalwart. <laughs> now, how do people get in touch with you? You can get in touch with me on Twitter. You can send me an email, richard at burn.media. You can watch my YouTube channel uh and message me there or find me on instagram or linkedin i or my myspace i think i saw a myspace page so uh check that out. actually i don't but uh <laughs> <laughs> if you updated it that would be one thing <laughs> excellent and for me uh you can find all of these webinars via via disnextvista.org and find like the right link on the front page or directly to the webinars pages via tinyurl.com slash rh-webinars20 you can reach me at rh at nextvista.org. And our next episode of Two Ed Tech Guys, Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff, will be next Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. I hope that you will join in because we just love sharing these ideas with you. And, and you guys are sending us cool questions. If you're thinking to yourself, I've got a question, send it. We're happy to answer it. And if you are participating in the recording, as a number of you are, then as soon as we finish, uh, the, the recording. We will keep talking to you because why shouldn't we do that, right? So with that, I'm going to say to everybody who's out there, maybe watching this either live or as a recording, thank you for joining us and we hope you will join us next week.